Hi everyone, I'm Daryl, founder of Yard Farmer, and this is video three in our four-part video series on how to design a sustainable park strip. In video one, we tackled research, prep, basically all of the things you need to find out and prepare before you break ground on your project at all. In video two, we talked about site prep. So now we're actually getting shovels in the dirt, we're removing the grass and prepping for install. So now congratulations, we finally got to the fun part because today in video three, we're going to be designing our park strips. We're gonna help you figure out what plants to plant for your region and how to make it look really, really good. So when you are starting from ground zero, chances are you have plain old Kentucky bluegrass in your park strip. We're gonna rip all of that out. We covered how to do that in the second video and now we're choosing plants. There's a reason I make you wait until video three to actually start designing your park strip and choosing plants and it's because all of the decisions we've made from video one and video two will affect what plants we pick now. So if you identified any major design constraints like a gas line or an existing tree, that's going to affect the plants that we can choose. We're gonna apply critical thought to our unique site and make sure that we are really designing for the conditions where our park strip exists and not just copy pasting the admittedly very cute plants that I'm about to put into place today on this park strip. So now we're assuming your grass is ripped out. We're starting from baseline. The first thing you need to do is choose where people are crossing your park strip. Again, sorry, we're not talking about plants yet, but the flows of traffic are really important and we need to decide on that first. So in this case, I'm just using two one by three concrete pavers, one foot deep, three feet wide. We're gonna offset them diagonally just for some visual interest and somebody, if a car were to park right here, the passenger door could swing open, they could step out and comfortably cross the park strip. Depending on the length of the park strip, you might need one of these, two of these, four of these, seven of these. If you live on a corner lot, just go out and stare at the street. Imagine where a car would park if they were pulling up to your house. That's where I would place these crossings so that we're not trapping people between the curb and your plants. Once you have those flows of traffic established, the pavers, flagstones, stepping stones, whatever you wanna use are down. Next thing you can think about is trees. If you already have existing trees in your park strip, go ahead and skip this part. But if you don't, it would be nice to get some in. And what's great is that every city has a list of approved street trees. So you truly don't have to get decision paralysis for this, go type in your city approved street trees into Google. The PDF will come up. It's usually a list of 15 or 20 trees. I guarantee you on that list, less than 10% of them are gonna be native trees. So if that's two trees, three trees, four trees, congratulations, that's your list of trees to choose from. Pick the one that speaks to your soul the most, but they're all approved for your park strip, so you're allowed to plant them. It's that easy to make a decision. In this case, I'm using a service berry because it is a really kick-ass native tree, and it also happens to be edible, and the birds really love it, so it's wins all around. You're gonna be placing that in your park strip where there's enough space that if a passenger door is gonna swing open and someone's gonna step out, they're not going to have to limbo underneath the canopy of a tree because that's just uncomfortable for everyone involved. Trees placed, concrete pavers are placed. From that point on, we're going to get grasses in first. Remember, this is a pocket prairie. This is a mini meadow. So grasses are kind of king here. And we have a limited number of grasses to choose from because we have to stay limited to 24 inches and below in most municipalities. Again, apply critical thought to your unique site because if you're allowed to plant things that are four feet tall, then a whole new world of native grasses has just opened unto you. But in our case, 24 inches and below is what we're working with in Salt Lake City, Utah. So I'm going to go ahead and use a bunch of Idaho blue fescues. That is a native grass with a spherical bunching habit. Really, really cute. And it only gets about one foot tall, one and a half feet when it's putting out its cute little seed pods, but they're pretty wispy, so it doesn't really look that tall. Allow me to pause for a second and say, I'm designing this park strip to be native to Salt Lake City, Utah. But if you don't live in the Rocky Mountain region, never fear, because we've actually put together a resource for you that gives you the suggested park strip plants under 24 inches tall for the East Coast, the Midwest, the Rocky Mountain region, and the West Coast. And you can find that over on our website. We'll put a link in the description of this video. And I'm gonna talk more about it in depth when we get into the individual plant selection part of the video. Regardless of where you live, we're doing a native grass under 24 inches tall as the establishing, sort of the frame, the backbone, the muscle of the landscape. Then you wanna fill in with the pretty stuff the flowering perennials. And if you wanna keep it really simple, I'd say just pick a complementary color palette. So blue and orange or purple and yellow, something that's opposite 
on the color wheel. In my case, I'm using a native aster and a soul dancer daisy for a little pop of purple and yellow. I might throw a little common yarrow in there for some additional buttery yellow goodness, maybe some Rocky Mountain Penstemon for that purple, but I'm just staying in a two-tone color palette because I don't want things to be super chaotic and I don't want to overcomplicate my design and get decision paralysis. Once you have your native grasses, you've got three or four flowering perennial types. You can use multiple of these, right? You can see here that I've got one, two, three, four, five, six Soul Dancer daisies pictured. And the park strip keeps going, so I'm actually buying probably 12 or 14 Soul Dancer daisies. The asters are peppered here as well. But as far as the actual number of plant types, the variety of plants that you're gonna purchase, it could be three or four plants max. You don't have to go absolutely nuts with this. And you're gonna pepper those throughout until you just have these little gaps near the steps, near the trees, and then you're gonna pick a lower growing sort of ground cover adjacent plant. Think creeping thyme, that's one that a lot of people recognize, but you wanna try, creeping thyme's still great, but you wanna try to find a native version. In our case, we could do a Silverton Blue Mat Penstemon. Max is out at like four or five inches tall, has a creeping habit, kind of like creeping thyme, and really pretty blue and white flowers. That's gonna look a little something like that. That's how you design a park strip. It's pretty simple and straightforward. The reason that we're filling in these gaps with ground covers is that we're aiming for 100% plant coverage. We don't wanna see the mulch. This is not a landscape where you've got a bunch of mulch and a little petunia and a daisy and a petunia and a daisy, and then we're topping up the wood chips once a year. That is a recipe for a bunch of maintenance and a bunch of weeds. We're looking for a native ecosystem that can thrive on neglect, thrive on its own, and demand very little work and water from you in order to function. Best way to do that is to get all the soil covered so there's no light and no available space for weeds to come in and start ruining this gorgeous design that you've just installed. Well, yes, we're aiming for 100% plant coverage so that your plants are actually your living mulch. It's gonna take two or three years to get there because when you're buying these plants, they're in little plug trays or little one gallon pots. It's not gonna look like this at first. We're gonna want two inches or more of wood mulch to help with moisture retention and weed suppression and generally make your life easier for the next two to three years. So now that we've gone over the general format for how you're going to put together your park strip layout, you have to choose plants that are actually native to you. So we went ahead and found a bunch of native plants for four different major eco regions in the United States, East Coast, Midwest, Rocky Mountain region, and West Coast. And we've pulled our favorite park strip friendly plants that are 24 inches and below. We put them on the resources page of our website so that you have all of these videos and all of those plants accessible in one place. Head on over there, there's a link in the description of this video. So let's start on the East Coast. We're gonna pick out our grasses first. You only need to pick one or two types. I would do a purple love grass, maybe a poverty oat grass or a combination of both if I was in a relatively dry-ish and full sun site. Again, you you have to apply critical thought to your unique site. So if you're getting a ton of water from the street or stormwater runoff or a downspout's pointed right there, or you just live in a place where it rains a ton and there's always standing water in your park strip, do a sedge. Do something that's adapted to like a more wetland region native to you. So now that the grasses are in, you want to add in your flowering perennials. You could keep it really simple. Let's pick one purple, one yellow. We'll do a wild geranium for a purple and a Maryland gold aster for the yellow. Fill in two things there, three things there, pepper them throughout the park strip. Then we're just filling in those empty spots with a ground cover. So for native ground covers to the East Coast, I'd do something like a white avens or maybe a creeping phlox, or maybe I'd even do both of them and just pepper them in together. So if you live in the Midwest or the Rocky Mountain or the West Coast, I'd apply that same principle, but using your native plants. Again, you can find a comprehensive list over on our website. For park strips in the Midwest, I'd do something like an echinacea, purple cone flower, or a common yarrow mixed together along with a blue gramma grass. For the Rocky Mountain region where I live, I'd do maybe like a blue and orange with a Rocky Mountain penstemon and a scarlet globe mallow, and then use a blue gramma grass, maybe an Indian rice grass. And then for the West Coast, I would do, I mean, you could do like a California poppy and a silvery lupin, which would be that purple and orange with a California fescue, for example. And I know I've said this probably like 17 times already since the start of the video, but you need to pay attention to the unique conditions of your site. So if that's stressing you out and you're not sure how much light your park strip is getting or how much water your park strip is getting, you could always book a consult with us or 
go to the website and check out more of the resources we have available. Your homework is going to be to build your plant list. So actually go do your research on your site conditions, look up which plants are native to you and under 24 inches tall and decide which plants you're buying. Make sure that they're available locally at a nursery. Next video, we're gonna talk about how to get those plants in the ground, when to plant, how to prep, how much water they're gonna need, how to establish them, all of that good stuff. We'll see you next time.